Happy Father's Day to all you fathers, if you are a father, mm -hmm. and also to our Heavenly Father, who is the perfect father. So let's go ahead and sing this to him, too.
and earth has quaked before moved by the sound of his voice seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard through it all through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well through it all through it all my eyes are on you it is well with me Far be it from me to not believe Even when my eyes can't see And this mountain that's in front of me Will be thrown into the midst of the sea Through it all, through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well through it all through it all my eyes are on you and it is well it is well so let it go Would you pray with me? Thank you, God, that you are truly the good, good Father. That you love us unconditionally. You look at each of us with eyes of compassion. You sent your son to die on our behalf. You out, reach out to us with an open hand that says, come. Come and believe. And God, so we choose to believe 
that there is nothing that can separate us from your love, neither life nor death, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things yet to come, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation, God. Nothing can separate us from the power of your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So God, we hang on to that today. When we have decisions to make, God, we choose to trust in you. When we don't know the next steps, when we're confused and the way seems foggy, God, we trust in you. When our kids are going sideways, God, we choose to trust in you. When our marriage, we don't know if it's going to hang in there, God, we choose to trust in you. God, you are a good, good father. And God, in this week too, we do remember the high schoolers and the leaders who are there in Haines, Alaska. God, be with each of them. Be with Brody and Ashlyn and Tucker and Tim and Nate and Natalie and Sophia and be with Jeremy and Amy and Barnabas and Liam and Lorraine. God, be with them all. Use them by the power of your Holy Spirit to be Jesus to the people they meet, to the kids, the middle schoolers, the adults. And use that Christian community to bless them as well in ways they are not expecting. Surprise them, God. Not just with the beauty of your amazing creation in that place, but the beauty of your love through your people. Surprise them on this day. And God, on Father's Day, I pray for all those who are fathers of young children who are still in the home, children and teenagers. God, give them all the wisdom that they need, all the patience, all the love, all the grace for the awesome task that they have before them. And for those who are fathering adult children, God, give them also an extra measure of your love and grace and tact to know what to say and how to say it. God, we thank you for our spiritual fathers, for those who have mentored us, those who have nurtured us in the faith, God. We are eternally grateful. And God, even though some of us here are not fathers, we have all been fathered in one way or another. For those who fathered us well, God, we thank you for them. And we give you praise. And God, for those who did not, give us the courage and the grace to forgive. You are the one true perfect Father, God. And so we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and us together to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Love that prayer. I love that prayer. So last week, Barnabas started a new sermon series. <clears throat> it's one that we're calling the I Am series who Jesus says he is. And there are a lot of ideas out in the world about who Jesus is. As we sang in the hymn earlier, in the song earlier, a lot of people wonder about who God is, and they seem to have some ideas about who God is. And so for this sermon series, we're going to be um, reading through the Gospel of John to see who Jesus says that he is. Isn't that a good idea, right? Okay, if we want to know who Jesus is, let's go to the source, right? 
So last Sunday, Barnabas looked at Matthew's gospel where Jesus revealed that he is the Christ, the crown prince of the universe. Jesus came to earth to start a revolution. The enemy is evil itself. The method is the cross, and the destination is resurrection. And for the rest of this series, then, we'll be in the Gospel of John. And I know it's summertime, we take a break on stuff, but friends, I really encourage you to read through the Gospel of John on your own in the next several weeks. It's an amazing book. It's different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's not so much history. It's more about who Jesus is. That's John's point. It's a book about Jesus' identity. And so John includes a lot of Jesus' miracles in his, miracles in his gospel, including seven miracles that he calls signs, um, markers that point to who Jesus is. And so on these seven occasions, Jesus answers a question by saying, I am, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the light and others. And I need to explain something too. Now just using the phrase I am is really powerful that Jesus even says that. Because you see Jesus is using the same words that the God of Israel used to describe himself in the Old Testament. In Exodus 3 God comes to Moses and tells him, you Moses are going back to my people, the Israelites, they're slaves and you're going to bring them out of Egypt. And Moses says to God, well, what if the people ask, what is the name of the God who sent you here? What should I tell them? And God responds, I am who I am. Tell the Israelites, I am has sent you. God defines himself by himself. Only God can do that. God is unique, one of a kind, a God above all other gods. And so by using this same phrase, I am, Jesus puts himself on the same level as God, as the one true God. Jesus lets the world know that he is God. Okay, so you understand why that I am phrase is huge for us. Well, John is the only gospel writer who shares the sub I am sayings of Jesus, and he does so for a purpose. If you read in John chapter 20, verse 30, he writes, Jesus did many other signs not written in this book, but these are written so that you, the reader, may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing, you may have life in his name. John wants us to know who Jesus is. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. And by trusting in who Jesus says he is, he wants all people to receive eternal life. So that's our hope for this series, too, that each person who hears these words will really realize who Jesus is and believe in him so that then we can then share the truth of who Jesus is with the world, right? So before we read the scripture today, would you pray with me? <clears throat> Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's look and see what John chapter 6 says today. <clears throat> starting at verse 25 when they, the crowd found him on the other side of the lake they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered I tell you the truth you are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs but because you ate the loaves and had your fill do not work for food that spoils but for food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. On him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, 
Well, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. And then Jesus repeats this in verse 47 and 48. I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Friends, the grass might wither as it does by the end of Rogue Valley summers. The, fl the flowers might fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Thanks be to God. I don't know about you, but I love bread. <laughs> you know, a good hearty multi-grain, a light and fluffy croissant, oh, a moist pita with chicken salad, a tasty naan with a tangy dip, oh, and I'm supposed to be gluten-free, right, you know? But just writing this sermon made me realize how much I love bread. And bread is called the most important food. And why? Well, because it's been around for thousands of years. From ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia to people groups of Africa and the Native Americans of the Americas, bread has been a staple for the human diet for centuries. In fact, did you know, if you go to the Egyptian part of the British Museum in London, you can see on display a loaf of bread that archaeologists say is 5,000 years old. That's one old loaf of bread. <laughs> That's amazing. It was discovered in an ancient pharaoh's tomb. The pharaoh wanted to have bread in the afterlife, so bread was buried with him when he died. Well, I don't know where the pharaoh is now, but the British Museum has his bread, so... <laughs> no. Even the word bread is used in different ways in our language. We say that the work that we do to pay our bills is our bread and butter, right? The person in the family who earns the most money is the breadwinner. And back in the 60s, some of us remember that a slang for money was bread or dough. Give me some bread, man, you know? Yep. And when we say the Lord's Prayer every week, we pray, give us this day our daily bread. How many of you grew up with a little food platter like that at home? Yes, exactly. And yet, when we say this prayer, we're actually saying, God, give us this day all that we need for life. Not just food, but everything that we need just for this day. And in our passage today, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am your most important food, your main sustenance, the source of life. I alone satisfy your deepest spiritual hunger. Jesus says these words to a crowd of people, people who have deliberately sought him out because the previous day they had witnessed one of Jesus' miracles. You can read about this miracle at the beginning of chapter 6. The crowd was there when Jesus used two fish and five barley loaves to feed about 5,000 men. And John doesn't tell us how many women and children were there. So just two small fish, five small barley loaves, cheap bread that was considered the food of the poor. And he feeds this crowd. Later that same evening, Jesus' disciples get in a boat and set off across the lake to Capernaum. And Jesus walks across the water to meet them. It's another miracle. The crowd doesn't see this one, but the disciples sure saw it. 
And John tells us that once Jesus got into the boat, he says, immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. I never noticed that before. So not, not only does Jesus walk across the water, but he's able to transport the boat from one side of the lake to the other without an outboard motor. I don't know, but you know, it's like another miracle that's right in the midst of the miracle. And it just reminds me too, and I love this, about how um, that we really don't know everything that Jesus did when he was on the earth. John concludes his gospel in chapter 21, 25 by saying, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have enough room for the books that would be written. Friends, we think we know everything about the three years of Jesus' life. I don't think so. There's so much more there. So back to our text. So, so when the crowd that was fed with miracle food realizes that Jesus and his disciples have left the area, then they get in boats and head across the lake to Capernaum to find them. And that's where our text then begins today. So these folks finally catch up with Jesus and they say, Rabbi, when did you get here? In other words, we've been looking for you. Where have you been? But they're not really interested in Jesus. Not him, not his message. They just want breakfast, right? And Jesus says, hmm, he figures it out right away, in fact. He exposes their motivation for coming to see him. He says, you're coming looking for me, not because you saw God in my actions, but because I fed you. I filled your stomachs for free. The crowd is simply looking for earthly food, not for Jesus himself. But Jesus does not push them away. Instead, he draws the conversation deeper. And friends, Jesus is that way with us too. Sometimes it's only when we're stuck in a bind that we remember to pray. We come to Jesus as the fix-it guy, right? The one I go to when I'm really in deep water. We don't want a relationship with Jesus necessarily. We just want the benefits that Jesus provides. And when we pray, Jesus, help me. Jesus does not push us away. Jesus simply longs to draw us in closer, deeper, to have a relationship with him. And this is when Jesus says to the crowd, don't work for food that spoils. Work for food that endures to eternal life. Jesus isn't saying to stop working for a living. He's saying that their main quest, their focus, should not be for food that has an expiration date. Focus on that which lasts forever. That's profound. You know, when you think about it, because most of us spend our lives working for food that spoils. It doesn't mean that we're greedy, necessarily, but the focus of our lives are things on this world. You know, providing a good home, driving a nice car, or at least a car that gets you from point A to point B. Acquiring the fun toys and gadgets and boats and RVs, being well entertained, taking great vacations. You know, speaking of which, I know a family that goes to Disneyland two times a year. It's the only place where they go for vacation. I'm really concerned about them. I don't know. There's, uh, something's not quite right about that. So. Um, so many people spend their lives earning money to be able to have the nice home and the fun toys, the newest gadgets, the best vacations. And then, isn't it interesting, we buy insurance to protect all the things that we buy, just in case we get in a car accident, our home gets broken into, when the toys get stolen, whatever, right? Now, believe me, I'm not saying that insurance is a bad idea, right, David? No, not at all. <laughs> no, it's very good. And there's nothing sinful about all these things that we acquire in life. It becomes a problem, though, when we think these things are the things that truly feed us, that make life worth living, even. A beautiful home can be destroyed in a fire, as the herons know. Gadgets are soon outdated when the next best thing comes along. 
And fun toys, whatever their size, eventually get rusty or break down. Especially boats, I hear. Anybody have a boat? Jesus says, don't waste your energy striving for perishable food like ordinary bread. Work for the food that sticks with you, food that nourishes you for eternal life. I remember visiting one of our dear church members uh, shortly after his doctor placed him on hospice. Friends, this man had given away hundreds of thousands of dollars over his lifetime. He was a wealthy man and a true philanthropist. But once he was on hospice, his home was a 10 by 12 foot apartment at a care facility. It contained a bed, a dresser, two or three simple chairs, and not much else. As I greeted him, he kind of spread out his arms to acknowledge the sparseness of his living arrangement and said, all the things I once had in life has been reduced to this. And he was not complaining. He talked about his faith and the comfort that it gave him as he knew he was dying. He talked about the people who had come to visit him once he moved into this place and once he was on hospice. People he had not necessarily known well before, but who, now that he was on hospice, they came to see him and he was able to have deep spiritual conversations with them. And again, this man had given away hundreds of thousands of dollars over his lifetime in the Rogue Valley and beyond. But in his final days, none of that mattered to him. What was important was his faith and his relationships with people, which became the opportunity for sharing his faith. So think about it. How much does your life focus on food that spoils? Things that have an expiration date. If you had a pie chart illustrating where your energy goes in a given week, how big a slice would represent the things that matter for eternity? And how big a slice would represent the things that perish. Jesus says, only food the Son of Man provides is food that lasts for eternal life, because only he has the Father's seal of approval. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Seal of approval. Anyone here familiar with the phrase, the Betty Crocker seal of approval? At one time, for many Americans, the name Betty Crocker evoked an image of domestic perfection. Betty Crocker was a creator of cookbooks, cake mixes and frostings, food containers, kitchen utensils, and that red spoon with the white, white writing meant that the product or recipe was trustworthy, the best that there was, so the consumer could rest easy. And what about the good housekeeping seal, right? It's often seen also as a stamp of approval, an indication of a quality product. Well, according to the website, it actually means that the Good Housekeeping offers a limited warranty in the form of a refund, repair, or replacement if the product carrying this seal is found to be defective within two years of purchase. But you didn't know that. Okay. So you can find the Good Housekeeping seal on thousands of items, from artificial Christmas trees to home appliances, from cleaning products and anti-aging creams. Not that I would know about that or anything. But Jesus says that God himself has put his seal of approval on Jesus. That means that who Jesus is and what Jesus does are fully guaranteed by the Father. 
Jesus alone is guaranteed as fully trustworthy. Jesus alone meets God's highest standards. Jesus alone is guaranteed to last, last through all of eternity. No two-year limited warranty here, friends. Okay. Once again, though, in our passage, the crowd misses the point. Jesus says, work for food that endures to eternal life, and the people get hung up on the idea of working. They're stuck in the physical necessities of life, so they want to find out, what do we need to do to do the works God requires? For these Jewish questioners, obtaining eternal life consisted in finding the right formula for performing works to please God. It's a mindset of earning, of following the proper steps, doing the right thing to achieve the desired result. Well, we sometimes get in that mindset too, don't we? We think, well, if I come to church, if I'm a good person, if I don't cheat on my taxes, if I'm faithful to my spouse, well, of course I'll get into heaven. That's what it's about, isn't it? But Jesus says something different. Jesus says, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Believe. Simply believe in Jesus. You see, God doesn't have a mindset of earning. God has a mindset of grace. God loves us when we don't deserve it. God, Jesus died for our sins, not for our good deeds. The mindset of earning says, if I do the right thing, if I'm a good person, God owes me then what I deserve. The mindset of grace says, I deserve death. I rebelled against God and I deserve the cross, but Jesus took it in my place. I deserve hell, but God offers me heaven. A mindset of grace says, God gives me life, and out of gratitude, I give my life back to him. So all Jesus says here is to simply believe. Believe in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. That's the language of grace. And it sounds foreign to us. Even as Christians, we feel like we need to earn our salvation. We've got to do something, right? I'm not good enough for God. Well, not surprisingly, the crowd doesn't quite get it either. They're not satisfied with the idea of simply believing in Jesus, like that's enough. And they need something more from him if they are going to fully trust him. And they want more miracles. You know, did you hear that in the text earlier? They saw Jesus feed the crowd of 5,000, but that was only 5,000 people on one afternoon. Well, Jesus, in the Old Testament, they say Moses fed several hundred thousand people for 40 years with, with bread that came from heaven. And they even quote the ancient scriptures to Jesus as though he doesn't know it already, you know? The gall of these people is amazing. And so they say to him, okay, you've got the seal of approval from God. That's great, Jesus, but can you top what Moses did? Huh? Can you? Do something to earn our trust, Jesus. I mean, it's incredible. They go from this mindset of kind of earning something to a mindset of entitlement. Uh, it's like, I deserve what I want without having to do anything to earn it. That's what the crowd wants now. And sometimes that's what we want also. <laughs> you know, I've been like this crowd. Jesus proves his faithfulness to me. I trust in him until the next crisis comes, you know? And then, I need, then he needs to prove himself all over again to me, to me to simply believe, really trust that he is on my side, that he is faithful, that he is always with me. Theologian Dale Bruner says, we can ask Jesus for help to trust him, but we cannot require him to do something else to earn our trust. As though he has not already done enough and is not continually doing enough to deserve this trust. When we have a mindset of grace, we realize that we are all in equal need of God's grace. That all we have is a gift from God. That ultimately all we need is God. That our deepest need is an eternal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. 
a relationship that gives us abundant life now and eternal life in the life to come. And that's what Jesus says next. He says to the crowd, it wasn't Moses who gave the Israelites the manna from heaven, it was God, remember? For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to this world. And so the crowd still hung up on getting breakfast, jump at Jesus' words, wow, master, give us this bread now and forever. It's amazing, this story. It, kind of, it reminds me so much of John chapter 4 and the story of Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus talks with her about water, and she's thinking physical water, that water that she can touch and taste and smell. And Jesus is telling her about this living water, which only he can give her if she drinks it. Then she'll never be thirsty again. And of course, the woman wants this water because she doesn't want to have to keep lugging her water jar out to the well every day. She wants this water that is going to keep her from being thirsty again. And Jesus continues to explain more and more that he is the living water that he's talking about. Here in John, um, John 6, it's the same thing. The crowd wants this amazing bread, physical bread they're picturing. God, you know, Lord, we can't live without this bread. Give us this bread, they say. And that's when Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Anyone who comes to me will never be hungry. Anyone who believes in me will never be thirsty. The crowd comes looking for bread food that will spoil, a product with an expiration date, but Jesus offers them not just bread, but the bread. And not just life, but in the Greek, it says the life, everlasting life. Jesus offers himself. He makes himself as accessible to human beings as is divinely and humanly possible. Another way to read Jesus' words, the person simply coming to me will never ever go hungry. The person simply trusting me will never ever go thirsty. Jesus claims that he himself is that for which all human beings most long. The man we call St. Augustine was a bishop in the church in North Africa around AD 400, yeah, a little while ago. St. Augustine, though, was not always a saint. Both he and his family had dreams of him making it to the center of cultural power and influence. He believed his education would be a ticket to the upper class and the good life. Augustine also thought that sex would satisfy his deepest cravings. In other words, friends, he was well acquainted with the same demons that plagued 21st century Americans, the idolization of wealth, of power, and of sex. After he became a follower of Jesus Christ, he wrote his confessions a series of 13 books in which St. Augustine reflects upon his life in the light of scripture and the presence of God. One author describes Augustine's writings as a been there, done that theological account of the young and the restless. We're all going to want to go out and buy that book, I'm sure. <laughs> well, the opening prayer in his Confessions, book one, is the familiar words, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. It took many years for Augustine to make his way to the bread of life, but when he did, he realized that all of his deepest hungers, all of his deepest needs, all of his deepest desires found their satisfaction ultimately in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus, the bread of life, offers himself to us. We don't have to do something to earn his love. There's no formula to follow to achieve eternal life. All we have to do is simply come. Come and believe. God did all the work through Jesus' death on the cross, and our responsibility, our privilege really, 
is to simply come. How many of you fathers out there had the privilege of being there when your children first took their first steps? You may have gotten down on your knees and said, come to daddy, come to daddy. Well, these are the words Jesus says to all of us. Come, come and believe. And to all those who come and believe, Jesus promises no real hunger ever again and no real thirst. The writer of John sets the bar to, for coming to Jesus as low as possible, friends. His presence as near as possible. His life-giving nourishment as accessible as possible so that all may live as authentically and fully as possible. So friends, when you're making a major decision Jesus says, just feed on me. When you're confused and you don't know what the next steps should be, feed on Jesus. When you don't know if your marriage is going to make it, just feed on Jesus. And when your kids are going sideways, just feed on Jesus. Jesus says, I am all you need. Really? Yes, you need food. I will provide it. Yes, you need clothes and shelter. Yes, I will take care of that too. But beyond that, everything else is extra. It really is. All you really need is me. Because nothing else in life is guaranteed. So just come. Simply come and believe. Would you pray with me? Holy God, forgive us when we sometimes make life so complicated. We get so caught up in the things of this world, the things we see with our eyes, can taste with our lips. God, help us to continue just to look to you and to your son, Jesus Christ, the bread of life. He is all that we need. He is enough. And help us to rest in that on this coming day and this coming week. We pray this in Jesus' name. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. God truly gives us all we need. And God has given us everything. God has given us himself. And so we have the opportunity now to share of what God has given us. It belongs to God. Anyhow, we're just giving it back to God. Um, to share it with this faith family so that we can share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in this valley and beyond. So I invite those who are receiving the offering to take it. And if you have your connection cards, you can put it in there too. Thank you. We'll stand. As we sing, let's dance. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. You're the one who guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you.
when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Every single dream I lay each one down at your feet Every moment of my wandering Never changes what you see I've tried to win this war, I confess My hands are weary I need your rest Mighty warrior, king of the fight No matter what I face, you're by my side When you don't move the mountains I need you to move When you don't part the waters I wish I could walk through When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. Truth is, you know what tomorrow brings. There's not a day ahead you have not seen. So, when all things be my life and breath. I want what you want, Lord, and nothing, nothing less. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. You are my strength and comfort. You are my steady hand. You are my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Your ways are always higher. Your plans are always good. There's not a place where I'll go. You've not already stood. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. Trust in you. I will trust in you. Friends, if you keep reading in the Gospel of John at the end of this chapter, you find out that these words of Jesus became a real defining point for the for his followers. 
It says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. When Jesus sees this happening, he turns to his 12 disciples, the 12 that are closest to him, and asks them, do you want to leave too? And Peter replies, Lord, to whom would we go? You alone have the words of real, eternal life. So my friends, what are you going to do with Jesus' words today? If you have not come to the bread of life, if you have not received him, do not believe in him, I invite you to take that step today. Come and believe. Jamie is our prayer minister and she would be privileged to pray with you and I would as well.